It's Tuesday, February 22. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Richard Biles, has issued a positive report card for Jamaica. He says economic activity and employment continues to rebound while foreign exchange inflows are buoyant and the country enjoys strong international reserves. The governor was speaking during Monday's quarterly monetary policy press conference at the BOJ. At the 16th of February 2022, Jamaica's gross international reserves were substantial, amounting to 4.3 billion US dollars and representing the equivalent of 140% of the level considered adequate. Looking at the Jamaican economy as a whole, the most recent GDP data published by Statin indicated that domestic economic activity expanded by 5.8% for the September 21 quarter compared with the expansion of 14.2 percent in the June 2021 quarter and the contraction of 10.6 percent a year earlier. <clears throat> this outturn therefore represents continued recovery in economic activity for the country. Governor Biles also reported that the labor market is on the rebound. The latest data uh, released by Statin indicated that we have an unemployment rate of 7.1% as of October of last year, 3.7% lower than that of October the previous year, and of note, 0.1% below the country's pre-pandemic unemployment level in October of 2019. Real GDP growth for the financial year 2021-22 is still projected to be within the 7 to 10 percent range before moderating to two point, from 2 to 4 percent for the financial year 2022 to 2023. However, the country's inflation rate remains a matter of concern. As we are aware, the inflation rate for the 12 months leading up to January 22, as released on Tuesday by Statin, was 9.7 percent representing the sixth successive month that inflation has been above the bank's target range of 4 to 6 percent. The January 22 outturn mainly reflected high energy-related inflation due to increases in electricity rates. In addition, the prices for processed foods and services accelerated due to the continued lag and second round impact of higher international grains and freight costs, which, we, as you know, have been the principal contributors to rising inflation over the past few months. Going forward, the MPC anticipated that without further stronger policy actions, inflation will continue to breach the upper limit of the bank's target range over the next 10 to 12 months and will peak in a range of 9 to 11 percent over this period. Faced with continued price increases, the central bank is defending its ratcheting of interest rates with its latest 4% policy rate. The governor is hopeful that further tightening of monetary policy will influence a return of inflation to the target range of 4 to 6% in the latter part of 2022. Government and the Jamaica Teachers Association have inked an agreement for a 4% increase in wages and allowances for the contract period April 1, 2021 to March 31, 2022. The signing took place during a brief ceremony at the Ministry of Finance in Kingston on Monday. In welcoming the accord, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says the accord has come on the back of two years of a global pandemic. With the pandemic still not over, Mr. Clark says he is grateful to the teachers for putting the national interest first and pledge to further review their compensation packages. We fully recognize that the, uh, the increases offered uh, and agreed on for the year 21-22 are, you know, uh, they could always be better given the circumstances, uh, but we are 
uh, pleased that we've been able to reach an accommodation with the Jamaica Teachers Association with the understanding that we are in a pandemic, still emerging from, and we plan in the next uh, fiscal year to implement, to begin the implementation of the uh, restructuring of public sector compensation. Dr. Clark notes that Jamaica is one of the few countries in this region that offered increases in both 2020 and 2021 in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, there are many countries uh, in our region here, and th this would have been the papers, would have been in the press, where they had difficulties even paying current bills, let alone offering increases. So we have to be thankful for that as well. Uh, I, you know, again, commit to working with the, the Jamaica Teachers Association uh, as, as they put it, and I, I really admire the, the words that you have uttered here today, that the Jamaican teachers, so, 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 Jamaican teachers, as much as uh, your own interest is important, at the end of the day, the national interest is, uh, is of extreme importance to the teachers of Jamaica. And I pledge to, to work with you uh, over the upcoming year and the years to follow uh, in the restructuring of uh, public sector compensation in a way that uh, inures to the benefit of teachers today and in the future. JTA President Winston Smith says teachers will always put the interest of the country at the forefront. However, going forward, he wants their compensation to be more aligned with the fiscal realities of the day. It has been a long ro road, a hard journey, I may say, but there has to come to a point when we converge around common cause. And I want it to be abundantly clear that the teachers of Jamaica has always and will always put the interests of the country to the forefront of all that we do. Notwithstanding, teachers are human beings that must exist within the economic framework within which a country operates. And therefore, Minister, we are expecting that as we move beyond this point, that our deliberation, discussion, and of course, compensation would be more aligned with what the fiscal realities of the countries are as it relates to our salary and compensation, as it relates to inflation rate, and of course, the opportunity of sustainability within the profession. And swiftly on the heels of Monday's signing, the Jamaica Police Federation is due to sign a similar agreement with government on Tuesday. In previous months, the union, which represents rank and file members of the constabulary force, protested over the issue of overtime pay with threats of industrial action. Governor General His Excellency Sir Patrick Allen has been released from the University Hospital of the West Indies after a medical examination on Monday. In a statement late Monday night, King's House said Sir Patrick and Lady Allen conveyed sincere appreciation for the many expressions of care and concern. It also said Sir Patrick resumes official duties on Tuesday. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Security Dr. Horace Chang is encouraging the top brass of the Jamaica Constabulary Force to formulate new crime-fighting strategies in order to stay ahead of increasingly sophisticated criminals. He made the call in an address to senior police officers at the JCF's Strategic Planning and Management Retreat held at Royalton Negril Resort and Spa in Westmoreland on Saturday under the theme, Transforming Improvement to Service Quality. Gabriel Thompson reports. According to Dr. Chang, the emergence of lottery scamming, particularly in western Jamaica, coupled with threats posed by cyber attacks and financial crime, have created a whole new breed of criminality, which requires the police to adjust their crime-fighting tactics. Dr. Chang says the money generated from scamming is fueling the guns for drugs trade, creating a new ecosystem in the criminal underworld which poses a threat to national security. He says while there is need for improvement, he is satisfied that the police have been relentless in their efforts to tame the crime monster. The National Security Minister also assured officers that government is committed to playing its role in ensuring that police are equipped with the necessary resources to boost the capabilities of the JCF. Gabrielle Thompson for the news on PBCJ. 
government is doing all it can to ensure that the Jamaica Defense Force is fit for purpose and that it can respond to the challenges of the day. This from Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, Andrew Holness, as he addressed a special commissioning ceremony on Monday at Up Park Camp for new army vehicles for the JDF. Mr. Holness says his government is committed to making the necessary investment in the security of Jamaica and to building out the capacity of the JDF, which he says plays a supporting role in all areas of national security. Investing in the JDF is investing across all areas of security for Jamaica. And that is a point that needs to be made over and over and over again. There is a perspective that is in the minds of Jamaicans, less so now than before, that somehow we have our soldiers ensconced at Up Park Camp and not in the field. That is not the report that I have. The report that I have is that the JDF is stretched right across the island, carrying out all kinds of functions. Uh, they are sometimes the unseen protection. Uh, and our forces are fully utilized. Among the six Thales Bushmaster protected mobility vehicles are three ambulances that will give the soldiers the ability to evacuate and treat injured personnel under armored protection. Head of the JDF. Rear Admiral Wemis Gorman says the new fleet will go a long way in expanding the Army's geographical footprint. For context, in 2021, the JDF had a total of 44,109 deployment in the land domain. That amounted to, counting each person, 2.9 million man hours, and year to date, we are at 7,764 deployments. As the JDF continues to expand its geographical footprint across the country, it is also essential that all our troops are provided with a high standard of protection as they undertake their duties in support of the JCF. While we carry out our duties to the citizens of Jamaica, we must ensure that the men and women of the JDF can work safely under all conditions. The PMVs, therefore, are a critical component of the force's capacity to uphold this duty to our soldiers and the citizens of Jamaica. The protected mobility vehicles are currently in service in eight countries in four continents. However, Australia, the Kingdom of Netherlands and Jamaica are the only three countries that currently operate the Bushmaster Protected Mobility Ambulance Platform. In his brief remarks, project manager for Thales Australia, Ron van der Dorn, said the company is delighted to continue its relationship with Jamaica, which dates back nearly 10 years. It's with great pleasure to be here today for this commissioning ceremony of the recently delivered Bushmaster vehicles representing Talus Australia and our CEO, Mr Chris Jenkins. Talus Australia values the long-lasting relationship with the Jamaican government, which is now approaching 10 years of support having commenced back in 2012 with the delivery of the first 12 Bushmaster infantry mobility troop vehicles from 2014. Subsequent to this vehicle delivery was the establishment of the initial vehicle support contract, which now extends out to 2024 and supports the delivery of the latest vehicles production contract of six vehicles. The Ministry of Health and Wellness will be spending more than $2 billion on the prevention and care and management of non-communicable diseases, NCDs, program during the 2022-2023 fiscal year. The estimates of expenditure now before the Standing Finance Committee of the House of Representatives will go towards increasing the capacity and efficiency of hospital services and the engagement of four consultants a construction engineer, medical equipment specialist, quantity surveyor, and an environmental health specialist. The funding will also facilitate the completion of detailed drawings and bills of quantities for 13 health facilities, 
completion of 3D models for health facilities, completion of minor works to facilitate laundry equipment, installation of three laundry equipment, procurement of medical equipment for health centers and for hospitals as well. The Prevention and Care Management Program has an objective of improving the health of the population by strengthening comprehensive policies for the prevention of NCDs, risk factors, and improve access to an upgraded and integrated health system. Time now for a look at the daily market updates with the Business Report. In foreign exchange trading for Monday, February 21, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $156.49. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $122.53. The pound sterling traded for $209.65. And the euro sold for an average $177.77. In Monday's trading session, the following reflect the movements of the JSC indices. The JSC index declined by 124 points to close at under 400,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 51 points to close at over 3,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 340 points to close at over 400,000 units and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 1,542 points to close at over 446,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 111 stocks of which 52 advanced 46 declined and 13 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Blue Power Group Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Traded firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Verbal Preference, Indies Pharma Jamaica Limited Ordinary Shares, and Jamaican Teas Limited. QWI Investments Limited was the volume leader with over 7.6 million units, followed by Carreras Limited with over 3.9 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2.6 million units. In market data for oil, the commodity hits its highest since 2014 on Tuesday as tensions between Russia and Ukraine escalated after Moscow ordered troops into two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine. Adding to supply concerns that are pushing prices to near $100 a barrel. The United States and its European allies are poised to announce new sanctions against Russia after President Vladimir Putin formally recognized the two regions in eastern Ukraine, escalating a security crisis on the continent. Brent crude, the global benchmark was up $3.38, or 3.5%, at $98.77 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude jumped $4.40, or 4.8%, to $95.47 a barrel. And that does it for this Tuesday's edition of the Business Report. I'm Danita Rodney. Pleasant viewing. In regional news, in Grenada, it was a matter of high tide and low tide thousands of dollars lost from waves of mother nature which resulted in a fishing boat being partially submerged in the waters of the carnage more details from gbn news the waters on the carnage st george are used as a safe haven for a number of fishing and cargo vessels however the owner of the vessel wildflower says an incident over the weekend is a lesson learned that calls for a closer monitoring of tides and where you want to dock 
owner of the boat, Jason Clowden, says it was brought to his attention early Saturday morning that his boat was sinking in the waters on the carnage. We got a call this morning about 4 o'clock this morning. Apparently what happened is when I tied up here was in the high tide. But now that the tide has dropped down low and retracted itself, the boat has leaned on one side and started taking in water. So now we're trying to wait on a pump to come to pump out the water inside and lighten up the vessel. That way we could try to float it out. Clouden says the initial attempt to get water out with some aid proved futile. Actually, yes. We had the fire truck here this morning trying to pump out some water but they didn't have the right hose. They didn't have a long enough hose to reach from the dock here into the boat. Uh, my dad is going to try to see if we could arrange a crane to come and stand here in case we don't get all the water pumped out to try to lift the vessel back straight. And then we could assess some of our damages from that point. The boat's owner is now counting his losses, which he says could span thousands of dollars. More or less my solar system, um, all of the navigational radios and instruments we have in the downstairs, yeah, that we'll have to take a look at each piece of equipment and whatever is not working we'll have to replace. Any I would say possibly between five to six grand. The vessel which is used for fishing will now have to undergo an extensive assessment before it can resume activity. Christalina John, GBN News. In Barbados, Deputy Prime Minister Sanchia Bradshaw says urgent reform is coming to the Barbados Licensing Authority. Bradshaw, who is also the Transport Works and Water Resources Minister, admitted that the government institution had several flaws that need to be remedied. More from Barbados today. She made the comments while pointing out that the licensing authority was still battling with a backlog of over 5,000 driver's licenses. It also requires, um, Mr. Speaker, I think a deeper look at the structure of the licensing authority. Um, there are a number of positions that have not been filled that have also impacted on the ability of the staff to be able to properly execute. We have a lot of good staff, but we also have some challenges in terms of structurally trying to get these, um, these things done. And so in the interim, we may have to now outsource certain services to be able to have the, um, the, uh, the, the driver's licenses scanned and be able to um, have a system of distributing them to the general public as well. Now, the good news is that there is already in motion plans for the modernization of the licensing authority. Uh, we started, I believe it was in 2020, with a process for um, ensuring that persons could pay for the renewal of their license online. With regards to the backlog, the Deputy Prime Minister said efforts were continuing to deliver those driver's licenses that had already been paid. She said the Licensing Authority's partnership with the General Post Office in delivering those licenses had not gone as smoothly as planned. The seven-day average of COVID-19 cases in St. Lucia continues to trend downwards with reductions noted in most of the public health indicators. That's the word from the country's chief medical officer who continues to advise protocol adherence as St. Lucia looks to live with the virus. The indicators of the COVID-19 pandemic curve of the crushing fifth wave appear to be declining as St. Lucia attempts to emerge from the heady days of the prolonged outbreak. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Sharon Belmar George, in the latest weekly update skewed towards living with the virus, provided insight into the overall numbers. As of February 21st, 2022, Senusha has diagnosed a total of 22,545 cases in country, with 1,048 active cases presently. The daily infection rate for the last seven days is 24.9 per 100,000 population per day which represents a 35% reduction from last week with a 21% average testing positivity rate and a transmission rate of 1.1. .1. 
we have noted a total of 358 COVID deaths. We have 24 positive cases admitted at the respiratory hospital. One case is critically ill and one case is severely ill. Since the commencement of the fifth wave on December 16, 2021, 9,416 cases have been diagnosed with an average of 143 cases per day. Women account for 58% of the cases and 62 COVID-19 deaths have been recorded, 63% of which is male. In sports, Kieran Pollard says there is no reason for West Indies to feel disgraced despite their 3-0 whitewash to India in the T20 International Series and has also warned against burdening Nicholas Puran, who with too much batting responsibility despite his current form. The Caribbean side went down by 17 runs on Sunday in the final T20 at Eden Gardens, marking the second whitewash in as many weeks after they also lost the preceding one day international phase 3-0 in Ahmedabad. However, Captain Pollard said the T20 series was actually much closer than the results suggested, and several of the players had reason to be pleased with their performances. The Jamaica women's under-20 team down to face Guatemala on February 26 in the opener of the CONCACAF under-20 championships has been named. Head coach Xavier Gilbert made the announcement on Monday about the team that will make up one of four in Group H of the championships, used to pick the three teams that qualified the 2020 Under-20 World Cup in Costa Rica later this year. According to a release, the coach has picked a squad with experience, despite the absence of Jolie Brown, who is part of the senior squad. The squad includes Malia Atkins, Alexia Spencer, Peyton McNamara, Chanel Buckley, Chanel Buckley, Neville Gale Abel, Dahlia White, Andrine Smith, Zoe Vidor, Christina Salmon, Chantel Parker, Annabelle Moore, Cameron Simmons, Maya Mitchell, Davia Richards, Serena Mensa, Leah Brooks, Shania Harris, Theana Burnett, and Javane Jones. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thank you so much for watching.